March 8th, 1983. This is Joe Todd, interview with Mr. Frank Marshall. Mr. Marshall, when were you born? August the 19th, 1900. Where were you born? Avoca, Wisconsin, A-V-O-C-A. -A. Small town, southeastern Wisconsin, on the Wisconsin River. Who was your father? Dr. W.C. Marshall. Was he from Wisconsin? Originally Cleveland, Ohio. Who was your mother? Uh, maiden name, Evelyn Bennett. What's the last name? Bennett. Bennett. Mm -hmm. Well, your father was a doctor? A dentist. Dentist. Mm -hmm. How long did you live in Wisconsin? Oh, we left there when I was two years old, although my parents were. My dad moved there. It was a, a pioneer state back in the 1870s when they moved there. And uh, it was my grandfather and, and there was four brothers. They moved there from Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, they, uh, granddad was, uh, a drummer in the Civil War. Well, uh, what was his name? Uh, Matthew Marshall. You ever tell you about the war? Oh the yes. War stories? What oh, did he yes. tell you about it? Oh, uh, he was he was only sixteen years old, and uh, about uh, the back then, you know, uh, a lot of that was done instead of buglers with with drummers. And uh, they uh, was the scarcity of food and, and uh, friend again friend, uh, and uh, he uh, would tell about uh, the uh, oh the different when he had orders to I want to remember very distinctly he had an order to uh, uh, drum. I don't recall whether it was retreat or advance or what it was, and whatever it was, one of the unusuals, and he he didn't know how to drum it. <laughs> what were the, some of the big battles he was in? That I don't recall. I really don't. Uh, I think the only one I th that I can recall was Gettysburg, and uh, they came here. Uh, in about 1898, my grandparents did, and one of my father's brothers. In fact, my grandfather came here in 98, and he had already retired in, in, in his early 40s. We're Bohemians. Our name is evasive, but uh, uh, they came from Bohemia. We call it Czechoslovakia now, but we still call it Bohemia. And uh, his uh, father died when he was quite young, and his mother remarried a man by the name of Marshall, and he took his stepfather's name. His name was Marushka. Now, don't ask me how to spell it because there's nine different ways. When did they come to this country? Uh, granddad came here, came to, to uh, Canada and then to Cleveland, Ohio, and married my grandmother, whose maiden name was Klupski. The Klupskis in Cleveland, Ohio, have been them and the Spirneys for many years as attorneys and doctors and lawyers. Uh, and then they migrated to, my grandfather must have been a pioneering type because leaving Bohemia and coming to Cleveland, I mean to Canada, then to Cleveland, Ohio, then to Wisconsin, and then to Oklahoma, and they were all pioneer states uh, that, that he, when he migrated to them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Did they ever tell you stories about the trip to this country? Uh, the boat trip? Oh, yes. Uh, they, uh, I think, uh, something like... Uh, Four weeks it was aboard ship on him, 
My grandmother, too, uh, she was an interpreter for the court. She was a linguist, same as my dad. Um, and uh, she was, granddad was hard of hearing. Grandmother was more fluent in reminiscing. I got a lot from her and then a lot from my mother. Uh, they, uh, there was quite a few of the Klopskys and such that migrated to Wisconsin, to Milwaukee and, and places like that, Prairie du Chien and uh, Manitowoc. In fact, I go up there every summer now. Missed this some past summer. Uh, they, uh, and music, all four of the boys were musicians, super musicians, I would say. And uh, that's what put my dad and his brother through dental school. They played with the orchestra in Chicago, the Fisk and Weldon. It was kind of like the Paul Whiteman of my day, that uh, that was where, although they, uh, they trooped in show business. In fact, uh, my father and his brothers owned the circus, the Marshall Brothers, and it's in the, uh, the paper and the pictures and everything is in the museum at Baraboo, Wisconsin, where the Circus World Museum is. That's where Ringling Brothers started. And uh, all of our instruments and such is, is up there. Wish we had them down here, but there was no such thing around here to place them there. That's quite a museum up there. It covers, they've got a full circus train of the different uh, uh, coaches and flat cars and such. In fact, uh, each morning they unload the flat cars with horses like they used to do each and load them. And the flat cars that they load and unload is a, a 101 Ranch Wild West shows. It is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They also have the uh, 101 Ranch uh, covered wagon that they used in the arena during the show, and uh, the bandwagon. They, it's quite, it covers 20 some acres. They put two shows on a day. It's under canvas. And uh, it, uh, it's quite a, well, it, it, 20 some, eight, over 20 acres. It, it, it's quite a sight to see there, really it is. Mm -hmm. They have a miniature parade every morning and uh, live band for this programs and such. Yeah. It's owned by the Wisconsin Historical Society, incidentally. Your grandfather came down here in 1898? Uh, no, eight, uh, yeah. How come they came to this country in Oklahoma? Uh, his brother, his half-brother, came here with a Santa Fe, his depot agent. To Perry? To Perry, yeah. Mm -hmm. John Marshall. And, uh, he, uh, dad followed, I mean, uh, then, uh, my granddad followed him and then, uh, his, uh, one son, Ed, who's part of his family still live here, uh, came and then, then Dr. Charlie and then dad, they, two of them practice here, to, uh, dentistry. And uh, your father came here in 192? Yeah. You were two years old. No, he came here in 191. We came in 192, the family did. You come by train? Yes, that was it. Do you remember the train trip at all? Uh, I, I remember, yes. I, the reason I remember it uh, more than anything is the fact that uh, I got lost in the Union Depot in Kansas City and uh, they, uh, I'd heard this story so many times, I guess, that I, I retained the picture in my mind, and they had a place, a little platform way up above that no loudspeakers, and a man came out with a, mag a megaphone, announced, boy lost, boy lost, and uh, they, uh, they found me then when those red caps had me over there eating ice cream cone. <laughs> Uh, and in those days you traveled, uh, you had uh, the fried chicken and everything in the boxes. You, uh, you ate uh, out of a shoe box on the train. Mm -hmm. 
What are your first memories of Perry? Oh, um, as it was, board sidewalks, muddy streets, and uh, uh, frame buildings. So many of them are frame. Uh, the uh, I remember the courthouse. It was framed. They have pictures of it here. And uh, I remember the every Friday night was uh, a uh, in the summer a band concert in the park. I remember the opera house, which was uh, for those days quite large. There's uh, pictures of it. Here. Is that still standing, the opera house? No. Uh, it's been down about 10 years now, and uh, it was upstairs. They, uh, and Kansas had the blue laws in. You couldn't, in Kansas on a Sunday, you couldn't even buy medicine back in those days. It was that uh, rigid. Uh, and it was for years that uh, they bootlegged the drug stores and what grocery stores cigarettes. You couldn't even sell a cigarette in the state. And... Uh, if you were out of gasoline, if you couldn't find somebody that bootlegged it, why, in gallon jars, or, or, or you didn't, you didn't move it on the old Model Ts and such. It was, therefore, they jump uh, from uh, Oklahoma City, New York Productions, and uh, the, uh, the George M. Cohen plays and like Little Johnny Jones and all those, and they they'd show in Perry. And uh, then uh, on, move on into Wichita. And that was all but train, too, in those days. They stayed in. A, at that time, we had, on the Santa Fe, we had eight passenger trains a day and the Frisco four. Uh, we had 12 passenger trains a day. And they threw here. Uh, even back when I went to high school playing football, we moved, we went to. Uh, we couldn't play anybody other than it was on a train that was on a railroad. Mm -hmm. um, Who were some of the actors you saw at the Opera House? Oh, uh, uh, actually, as the actors in those days didn't, the to me at that time, it was uh, the different shows like uh, Old Polly the Circus, Little John Jones, Peck's Bad Boy, and uh, shows of, of that type. And uh, in those days, it was uh, also was uh, the traveling uh, bands of, like the Royal Hazars and, and Mackenzie Highlanders and, and such as those uh, would, uh, and would uh, be in the Opera House. And uh, as far as the, uh, the one here is, you know, is Buster Keaton was, he lived here. And, uh, uh, in fact, we have his hat in there, and s some things like that. The Keatons lived here and worked out of here. Uh, in those days, uh, uh, naturally, everything was live. Um, I remember seeing a picture show with a carnival when I was just a kid. The tent was black, and the great uh, train robbery last maybe. 30 minutes, maybe little shorts that uh, uh, that they would do, and they'd have to do it to, without electricity, with uh, gas, lights, and such as that. The uh, And then uh, the Opera House, too, was uh, uh, all your high school plays and uh, your different organization. There was a lot of that uh, plays and all. That. that was the Opera House. All the meetings. Uh, the, the prize fights, what have you, was all in the opera house. It, uh, How much did it cost to get in? Uh, all in those days, I imagine on those bigger plays, uh, was a dollar. That was pretty much it. And then, yeah. they, oh, go ahead. then they built downstairs a mo that motion picture. And incidentally, a boy by the name of Arthur Campbell built the motion picture machine for walkie-talkies and, uh, and uh, named Arthur Campbell. And they called it the Annex. 
and it was the annex to the opera house. Mm -hmm. It was downstairs? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any of the uh, big opera singers come to town? I uh, no, uh, not that I recall. At my age, I wouldn't have. That wouldn't have interested me a whole lot. Uh, I remember they this colored pianist, uh, Blind Boom, and uh, in those days he was very noted. And he uh, play these different numbers, and then he'd uh, he'd ask you to give him a sentence, and he'd make a song out of it. He'd play the music and sing it. Uh, he'd stop and hesitate just a little bit, and that was predominantly school kids. Now that was an afternoon show. Then it was a night show too. On that. Did Cease's band ever come through here? Who? Cease's band, John Cease. Oh uh, no. Yeah. Oklahoma City. Okay. No, it was uh, a little too big for, uh, now there were bands equal to his, the uh, McKenzie Highlanders, and uh, and those, incidentally, my brother was with them, and they played, uh, there was the White Azars, the Black Azars, and oh, there was, uh, well, bands was very predominant, uh, and they do a full two hours, and, but they, they were versatile. They didn't just sit up there and play. They they gave them a lot of variety of, of entertainment. Uh, in fact, uh, the Six Brown Brothers, saxophone sextet, Tom Brown, Brown, whom I knew, uh, he was a former band director on the Ringman Show, had Sax's first uh, sax, a soprano straight model sax. Mm -hmm. What uh, what time period were these bands coming through? Uh, wintertime. No, what, what year? Oh, far back as I can remember. Mm -hmm. Yes, far back as I can remember. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, they, uh, and uh, in, in those days, too, we had the minstrel shows, you know, and uh, the, uh, they were, they'd have, uh, they were all white minstrels and did blackface on the stage they had their band orchestra, and uh, they it was uh, they were quite quite evident. And then there was a, in those days too a lot of dramatic shows that would come in and make a week stand in the theater. And then, then they went under canvas. Uh, those dramatic shows would come in and and show for a week in a different uh, play each night. Mm -hmm. uh, same way then later on under canvas. Um, and then uh, come along with the stuff was, they uh, they consisted of a little of everything from noted speakers to what have you, set up in the schoolyard and the afternoon and evening uh, entertainment there. When did you start school? Well, I started uh, in the middle town of Chelsea, over east of Tulsa, and. Uh, when did you move over there? We moved there in about 1905. How come you went over there? Uh, it was uh, a booming town, and Dad was a dentist, and and he, he always did work two ways. He'd have the municipal band and uh, and the uh, and his dentistry. He had to get permission to go into Indian territory. No, oh no, no no. It was just a, an imaginary line, as far as we were concerned. We, you didn't pay any more difference when you went in the Indian Territory than you did in Oklahoma Territory. No, it. Uh, How long you stay in Chelsea? Oh, no, we left there in 1909. Went to Woodward. Uh, how big was Chelsea when you first moved there? About the same size it is now. <laughs> Maybe uh, oh, 2000. Mm -hmm. What was statehood day like in Chelsea? Oh, there was a lot of shooting of guns and and uh, things of that kind, uh, shouting, drinking. Uh, that's about the only way you had to uh, make a noise in those days, other than firecrackers with with guns. Yeah. 
quite a bit of drinking that day, I assume. Oh, yes. Because yeah. they closed all the liquor stores in the saloons. No liquor stores in the Indian Territory. We had none there. Oh, that's right. That was in Oklahoma Territory. Yeah. And then we hit, they had uh, uh, the drug stores. You could go in a drug store and get a drink of, uh, they'd cut it down with a, a soft drink of some kind. Because in those days, the fountains only stayed open during the summer. Ice cream only during the summer. And uh, they uh, would uh, take and uh, you could go in and naturally I couldn't, but uh, and they could go and sit down and the druggist would uh, fix them a drink. That was the source of drinking. And then they had moonshine like they do now, still do. And uh, homemade beer, mm -hmm. homemade wine. Who was who were the big moonshiners around Chelsea? I wouldn't. I was quite young when I left there. I can tell you who they were around here, but <laughs> uh, and uh, some of them, uh, their offsprings are still around. In fact, uh, we had two families here, and uh, they live southeast of town. They uh, uh, would, uh, they'd meet here on Saturday. It was like the McCoys down in Kentucky. They'd have some of the damnedest fights. <laughs> uh, one got his nose bit off and one had his ear bit off. And, uh, and back then they, uh, they pretty much settled all arguments with their fist or a gun. Was, what were the arguments about mainly? Uh, they didn't know. They didn't know really. It was uh, you could you could ask them today if it was a lie. What why they were enemies and they couldn't tell you. Mm -hmm. And as time went on, they they, they intermarried and uh, uh, they uh, all of them, some of them uh, went to the penitentiary. They were they make moonshine. Those two families. Oh yeah, they're the big moonshiners around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where they make it? Out there on their farms. They did. Now, I remember an instance here when they uh, went out and confiscated a still, and it was so big they couldn't get it in the doors of the courthouse, and they left it set outside, and had one night policeman then, and this old boy, old Bill Bailey, come in and. Uh, they were cousin, got him drunk, and stole the still, and had it back working that night. <laughs> what were the names? Uh -huh. What were the names of the family? Bailey. Bailey? Mm -hmm. Bailey is down the city now. How did they, how did people buy the moonshine, or where'd they go to buy it? Oh, uh, just like you go to the liquor store now, you knew right where to go, I mean, uh, they didn't hide or anything about it. They, you, uh, you went right to, to their house. We had places here in town where you could go in and sit down and, and have it by the drink. For, uh, oh, depending on the size of the drink, 25 to 50 cents. What, and, the marshals wouldn't come in and? Oh, they, they'd go in and maybe raid them once every six months. When they didn't go get a drink, maybe yeah, they. Um, uh, it was uh, quite. Uh, I mean, well, it's kind of like your clubs in Oklahoma City now. It's the same thing. They know where they are, and you know where to go get a drink when you want. Well, at least I do when I'm there, and uh, I have a home in Oklahoma City, and uh, they. Uh, no, they, it was, and Perry, when the three sands boomed, that was the oil field north of here. Uh, I think we had uh, 25 restaurants, and every upstairs room in the house was a house of ill repute. And uh, and in the early days, you know, we had what they call Hell's Half Acre here. That What's was, it? Pardon? What's Hell's Half Acre? Well, it was uh, 
there was possibly 50 saloons over there. It wasn't in too big an area. And uh, they averaged uh, one and a half a killing or shooting in a day over there. And somebody figured it out mathematically. And uh, it's the area is still down there. And uh, where we, before we moved over where we did, it was known as Peckers Point. It was all uh, uh, whorehouses. And when Cow Creek, which goes through here, came uh, had a, a big gully washer and it, uh, it washed them all away. And, uh, and then uh, the folks built uh, over there in that area. But the, the, uh, the Hell's Half Acre was Cedar Street, which runs uh, east and west. And the Santa Fe tracks runs north and south from Cedar Street north and the Santa Fe tracks east. That was Hell's Half Acre. All houses of ill repute. Or saloons and such as that. Uh, that was, uh, and uh, about all there was in there was tents and uh, frame shacks and such. Yeah. Gambling halls. And, how long did that last? That was half. Oh, it lasted possibly, this is a guess, uh, to my knowledge and hearing them talk about it, possibly two to two and a half years. And they had about one kill in the day in there? One and a half average. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of people in two years. Well, uh, a lot of them, they, you got to remember this, that when the Cherokee Strip opened, a goodly majority of the people that came in here were hot as a firecracker from where they came from, very much so. Uh, and uh, we, uh, the one that deserve a lot of credit to me personally uh, is like the Tremens and all is the people that stayed here mm -hmm. and made this town. Because we paved, they paved, I'll say we, uh, the square in 1910. Uh, and that was, that was the people that stayed here. And the courthouse was a frame courthouse that was not owned by the county. The businessmen built it and uh, rented it to the county. Then they built this courthouse down here now in 1915. And that was pretty quick for a new town uh, or a new county. In fact, the first pavement uh, north of town, which is 77 now, was paid, uh, paid by the county. Uh, and uh, so the, the people that stayed here are the ones, as far as I'm concerned, like the Treeman, the Bowles and McCoys and, and, and such as that, uh, are, are the ones, to me, are the people that really made this at, at least this vicinity. It, uh, and uh, all you had in those days was the opera house and the way of entertainment, the, the traveling organizations on your canvas, your local band, uh, and your, your local band, you know, uh, was a businessman, and they played uh, for prom funerals, weddings, picnics, celebrations, what have you. Because there was no canned music in those days, you know. When did the uh, Three Sands come in? It came in, oh, we will have a big picture of it out here in about 1922. It really got big long about uh, uh, 23 and 4 and 5 and there. So Hell's Half Acre was back in the 20s? No, no. Hell's Half Acre was back in the uh, 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 1900. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. No, it was uh, uh, it was uh, about the last big boom, oil boom in the state, uh, and it was is this kind of county and K County, and uh, they uh, they it was the usual dance halls. Rooming houses, all frame, uh, in all the rooming houses was uh, houses of ill repute, and uh, the usual uh, bootlegger and gambling place, uh, 
you name it. And it was, I worked in the three kings. That's good. And the Keeleys, Lou Wentz, uh, our company out of Punk City, engaged up there. Mm -hmm. In fact, they hit one well on the Keeleys. Yeah, 11,000 barrels a day. And see, back then, they didn't perforate, so there was three three wells. That's where it got, there's three different sands. That's where it got its name. That's the reason it was, those rigs would sit right next to one another. Mm -hmm. They didn't have perforating like they do now. And go on down and perforate and go on down to the three different sands. They had three rigs. They, um, it was mud knee deep. Same as all boom towns in the state, uh, frame buildings, restaurants, primarily, and whorehouses. That was what really consisted of primarily, you know. And you started the school in Chelsea. Mm -hmm. What school, what was the name of the school? I couldn't tell you. Remember your teacher's name? Mm -hmm. Maggie Parks. Maggie Parks. Mm -hmm. She dipped snuff. What was your favorite subject? Math. Music. To me, it still is. I was a Navy band director. Mm -hmm. Was band director in the Old Hundred One Ranch Wild West show. Yeah. And. Uh, and um, what was the school building like in Chelsea? A frame building. Uh, was it one one room? No, no, it, it had about four. It was a pretty big one. Yeah, and uh, it started. Uh, you uh, you went home for lunch. Some of you, some didn't. Uh, you had those gallon gallon syrup pails, and pails and half gallons, and most everybody brought their brought their lunch in in, in those. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no such thing. Well, hell, is even when I was in high school here. You know, we didn't have the lunch in school, no. Mm -hmm. Then you moved to Woodward in 1909? Yeah. How long did you stay out there? About a year or so. About a year? Mm -hmm. And I guess because your father was a dentist, I guess. Music uh, actually is what uh, yeah. uh, 
they they wanted him to come back here and uh, to take her to take the band and uh, uh, he uh, and we did and stayed. We came back here, class of nineteen nine, early part of nineteen ten. How come he moved to Woodward? You see. I mean, did Woodward contact you to tell you to come in? No, I, um, I have a picture of, of the Woodward uh, band and uh, Bo Miskowski, that was band director at A&M. He was a bohemian. He got Dad to come out there and play in that. They, some occasion, and they, they used to pull the outstanding musicians from all over the state when there was something going on. And... Uh, I have a big picture of it, and uh, uh, that's uh, Bo. Then went to he had the band there, and he went over to Stillwater to A and M, and Dad took the band. That's how he happened to. Uh, mm -hmm. They uh, they both uh, uh, were typical Bo hunters. So. They moved back to Perry in 1910, mm -hmm. and you went to high school here? Mm -hmm. What year did you graduate? 1919. Did you say that you remembered any of the Depression of 1970? Vaguely. Vaguely, we were in Chelsea, and uh, in a town like that where you raised your own garden and all, it wasn't... Uh, as I recall. In fact, uh, I never heard uh, my parents discuss it. They they discussed the 1900 and what was it, two or three or long in there somewhere uh, when we had one. Mm -hmm. But see, I was in the 30s. In fact, I was in New York City when uh, playing there in Madison Square Garden when uh, the Depression the last one was just like uh, today everything was fine and tomorrow, bam, that's when they started jumping out windows and what have you. Yeah, it, it hit just overnight. That's when the stock market crashed. Right. It was right. Black Friday or Black Thursday. I don't remember what day it was, but uh, uh, I know uh, I, I had a room there, Cadillac Hotel in, the, in Times Square. And uh, back in those days, your newspapers extras were coming out all the time. And come down the street, and they would run and shouting, and uh, those extra, extra. We was playing there at the Madison Square Garden. Did you do any work for the war effort in World War One? Uh. As much, yes, as uh, somebody my my age uh, uh, could. What you do? Well, uh, oh, attended rallies and what have you, and uh, save this and save that, and uh, uh, at uh, World War One. I just uh, registered. I tried to enlist. They wouldn't take me. I don't remember why not. And uh, I registered for the draft. It wasn't even up for a call when it finished. And uh, but I was. Uh, I got arrested in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. I was on the road then. Uh, on the John Robinson show for draft dodger and uh, Tom Wessel was chief of police there they wired him and uh, he uh, they didn't hold me but uh, just a few hours found out that at that time I was only 17 that was 1918 and I hadn't leaped my 18th birthday yet and they uh, Turn me loose. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Were you in Perry when the armistice was signed? Yeah. What, what was that day like? Crazy. Crazy. People run, screamed. Automobiles went around the square honking their horns. People went absolutely insane. They, uh, I was working, uh, and the flu had been on, school was closed. There was an oil field out here, the Hoover Field, about 18 miles northwest of here. And uh, was riding with uh, Joe McClellan, who was later on a uh, banker here. He'd come down from Pennsylvania, and uh, he was dating the girl that he married here, Miss Ben, I saw her the other day, married some fella. <clears throat> her name was Madge Hester. And we just came to town and uh and they were stark insane here. It really and truly. It was unbelievable. It really was. Um what you do in the twenties? Well, show business. What was your first job? Oh, uh, you mean as a musician? Yeah, well, left you after high school. Well, uh, I even, I tripped during high school years. Oh, you did? Oh, yes. Who I with? Oh, I, I was with, uh, I, I was on John Robinson, and I was from South Slough, Eggenback Wallace. And uh, I started trooping when I was 15. Do you play an instrument? Yeah, what, what, anything? Yeah. I write it and arrange. Hmm. How many songs have you written? None. I got, no. I got some that I play on the organ that uh, was never going to put on paper. Hmm. You have yeah. a lot of them. I, I, I should, I guess. Uh, no, in my day as a musician, uh, you, I don't know anything about string instruments, and uh, you, when you went on a job, you played two concerts a day before the show, and uh, you didn't know what they was going to put up, you never rehearsed them, you had to be a sight reader. If you didn't cut it, you didn't study. Yeah. Did you play in any movie houses? Oh, sure. Yeah. In Perry? Uh, I played in the annex here, yes. Okay, what... Did you play while the, was this for the silent movies? That's right. Yeah, I played over there. Mm -hmm. Now, can you tell me exactly how or what you did during the movie? Yeah. Uh, you uh, you watched the show just the same as the, the audience did, and uh, you cued, cued it in. Uh, if... Uh, if it was cowboy scene and the horse was ready, you played a gallop was real snappy, and, and if uh, uh, fights, and if there was a, a love scene, you played the same type of music that, uh, uh, and if uh, uh, if there, or there was a wedding, you played uh, uh, Chopin's funeral march, and and, uh, uh, and I mean. Uh, uh, the, on funerals and, and such as that. Yeah, you, you cued it right. You stayed right with the movie. You watched it the same as the, and as fast as the changes were, you changed right, music right, right along with it. Now, did you have a cue uh, sheet music that you played with? Uh, no, no. Oh, some pictures now that was well advertised, they would send you a cue sheet. And that cue sheet would uh, give you like uh, hearts and flowers or whatever they uh, was in there. They would call the shots on it. And then when those specials come out, where uh, uh, the big ones, uh, they would send me some music. Mm -hmm. Now, did you have a? Did you have to memorize the cues, or did you have a cue sheet with all the movies? Oh, no. watched them through the first time and. Uh, and you formed your own idea of what, what you wanted to play. So you could play basically what you wanted. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. But you had to have a large repertoire of music then. A uh, medley, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How long did you play for the movie house here in Oh, 
off and on in the winter if I was off the road. Uh, it varied sometimes none, sometimes some. Uh, it uh, really didn't uh, make uh, a lot of difference. Uh, I mean, if you wasn't playing with a or I was playing with a dance band. Mm -hmm. uh, I come along about Dixieland time. Uh, I'm still addicted to it. <laughs> <laughs> you still play? No. Oh, uh, I played. Uh, I directed last year's spring band concert here, and uh, then the third of July, the the former high school. Musicians, incidentally, we got one of the outstanding bands here in the state. In fact, one third of the student body is in band here. And uh, and the second of the director. And I played, uh, now that I got store teeth, I played drums for the band concert in the park. Uh, and uh, if you ask about instruments, after it boiled down, drums, I think, was developed into my favorite uh, of all uh, percussions as it were, bells, timpani, whatever, uh, was my favorite. Uh, I liked it, and incidentally in show business, there was less good drummers. They were hard, uh, they were hard to come by because you take with the circus, that's all the key to do. You just don't play it extemporaneously. You play it with the axe. Uh, and if it's properly cued, uh, the audience should never hear the music. It should become part of the act. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, on uh, like on the Elephant Act, maybe you'll have six or seven numbers. Uh, on a show like the Ringling Show, you'll have 150 to 200 numbers. Not, not all of them, but a part of them that you cue in, for instance, on the riding act, you watch the rump of the horse. And like on the elephant act, when it does the cooch and gets up there and shakes its fanny, and when the uh, elephant lays on the girl, you're playing like a four four and dandy real soft and all that. It's all cued in. Uh, and uh, actually, the drummer, he really is the band leader because uh, he watches these acts and uh, the flying axe and uh, the wire wire axe, they come out and they'll do uh, uh, like a drunk or Spanish dance and so on. And uh, all of that's cued according uh, musically. It, it really is. It's, it's cued just the same as your theater is. Mm -hmm. When you start working for the uh, 101, 1923, the show went out in uh, 25, uh, I, uh, the Wild West show went out in 25, and uh, I went on it then, but I, I'd done advertising for them, for their rodeos and all prior to that. What do you do for the Wild West Show 101? Band. Band uh, director? No, I just played in the band to start with. What did you play? Uh, pardon? What did you play in the band? Well, uh, trombone, bass, baritone, uh, and uh, then I also uh, worked uh, one season as a uh, they call them barkers for the movies, but I talked around the side show, making openings, lecturing on the inside. And that's what I done on the Ringling Show, is uh, lecturing in the side show. Uh, now what's lecturing in the side show? Talking on the different creeks and such in there. Uh, it, uh, and the, those on the Ringling Show were bonafide, uh, armless artists. Jack Huber, who lost an arm as an animal trainer to a bear and another arm to a lion, he painted with his teeth. Uh, 
in the crash or swollen. Uh, and the uh, midgets and uh, Major Mike uh, and uh, Leo Graf. Leo Graf was a Jewish from uh, Germany. She uh, was prickly form. She is one of those that uh, the Jews that Hitler killed are in Germany. She went back over there. She did. Uh -huh. And the Dolly sisters were. Uh, uh, Midgets. There is a difference, you know. Midget is perky form, and dwarf is those with uh, short legs and arms and large heads. And um, the blue man, he, uh, I lecture on him. Hell, I don't know where he got his blue was, but uh, he worked in the mines in England and uh, and eating over here. He got distance enough where he's silverware and such that he continued on being blue. And then P.G. Lowry uh, was the, uh, they called him the John Philip Sousa of blacks, had the band and had that band. In fact, uh, uh, Andy wrote the P.G. Blues, that was for him. They uh, had one guy in there I never could figure. Uh, he was an Arab. He, uh, he had a charcoal burner and had this iron in there and he uh, I could smell it red hot and he'd take that with asbestos gloves and on his tongue on the red hot and bend it and I, I, I never could figure the gimmicks on that naturally he had to have one uh, the uh, had one chap on there that uh, was a cook and uh, he would sit here and talk to you with a potato. And he'd, in a matter of a minute or so, he'd, he'd have an exact duplicate of you. He cut out flowers. He had a solution dip them in roses, chrysanthemums, and stuff like that. In just a matter of two or three minutes. Because, see, everything in there worked fast. Because it was a walk in or a walk out. And, and uh, You'd show maybe to fifteen to twenty thousand people in the course of a day, like on a radio show. And they, um, it was, uh, and it had the proverbial punch and Judy, and I had a guy in there, a Cuban. I can't remember his name. He'd uh, light a cigarette and blow smoke out both ears, take one of those kid horns, put it up there and play it. Uh, and uh, not speaking Spanish, why? I didn't get too well acquainted with him. Hubert painted a, a picture in about two minutes painting with his teeth. Had a giant. He still listened one of the tall men in this country, Jack Earl. His real name was Jakey Early from uh, El Paso, Texas. Dad had a, a pawn shop out there. He worked in breweries. Big, just and uh, he'd sell those rings for a quarter tutor that the, he'd take off his finger and put a half a dollar through. Uh, how, how tall was he? He was <coughs> almost. Most of those was exaggerated. He he was. A, uh, I was reading this the other day and gave a list of of them. He was almost uh, eight foot. And as a rule, uh, most of them were cowboy boots with high heels, built up, and a high western hat uh, to increase to their height. And uh, standing next to a, a talker or announcer or a barker, what the hell ever you want to call them, why uh, they looked tremendous. And see them, it was a pretty good racket for me. Uh, I had a four people musical act there on there too. Uh, my wife and myself, her brother and and, and mother. Uh they uh, uh at the end of the week, see you make a, what we call a pitch. Had a three legged Frank Lentini that had three legs and kicked the football across the tent with his third leg. What was the third leg? Uh, right here. He had the uh, Frank had uh, Three legs, 
four feet, 16 toes, two stomachs, two penises, and two rectums. From here down, where he had the 16 toes, there was an extra foot on that leg and it had one toe on it. And uh, uh, he, uh, always ask a lot of times, have you ever tried to have that uh, leg get off? He said, what do you mean? Have my meal ticket cut off? And uh, he put a, a uh, belt back there down at night. He hooked that toe in it, so it hopped over there where he showed him and everything. That, that way he was just another another person. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he had three uh, normal children. And uh, he was born in it, it was Francisco. Uh, I can't remember his name. He went to Antonio or something. He was tickling, so he agreed with him and down. And uh, then you had the hot women and some girls. And I always expected when they went into one of those. And uh, um, I've done the same thing on my own show. Now, when did you first? have an interest in the 101 West Show, Wild West Show. Oh, uh. Did they contact you or you contact them to go work for them? Uh, in my day, as a musician, there was possibly 125 to 150 circuses on the road. And, uh, if you've been proven any length of time, for instance, you say, uh, guess who I saw over in such and such a show? And uh, you knew pretty well where everybody was. I found some old letters here a while back that my mother had kept from Spud Rettrick on the Arnold J. Barnes show, uh, writing me and saying we're headed back to the coast, come on. Didn't even tell me what instrument he wanted. Uh, no, uh, you didn't, uh, if you didn't like this one, you could step off and the billboard was our Bible. You uh, go to the billboard, and back in, that, in those days, it was all outside entertainment. Now it's the, now what the billboard? Yeah, magazine. Okay. It now is uh, it's for uh, all for jukeboxes and what have you, music and everything. In those days, it was strictly for outside show business, dramatic shows, carnivals, circuses, and what have you. So you started working for the 101 in 1923. Right. Who was Bandy Records then? Bandy didn't, now the show didn't go out to 25. I did advertising with them. Oh, okay. For their rodeos. Okay. Yeah. What kind of advertising? For the rodeos all over the state. Uh, I mean, uh, did you? One sheet, three sheets, and one sheet is, three sheets is about this wide, and Big sheets, those big billboards you yeah. see on that way. No. Did you do the artwork for them? Or? No, no, it was printed sheets. Uh, those big ones out there on the highway as a rule is what they call the 24 sheet. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you go around and taste these up around the state? Or? No, I went out to, to your local built billers like we had here, uh, taped, and uh, give them the paper. But you did you did the small stuff. Uh, you would you would go and. Uh, Hang in the store windows and the place cards and, and what have you. But, uh, and then you always contacted the local newspaper. And uh, you had some set form, uh, more or less a press agent. That was, uh, we still have them. Uh, in fact, a good friend of mine who died just last year uh, was a press agent and finally went on a general agent. And uh, you depended uh, 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 very much on your newspapers and your outside advertising. Very much uh, 24 sheets, uh, placards, one sheet, three sheets, and so on like that. Mm -hmm. Did you know the Miller Brothers? Oh, yes. What were they like? Can you describe them? Oh, yeah. They were all three different uh, people. All the brothers, uh, George was the money man. 
he uh, he lived on the ranch, but uh, he didn't. Uh, his dealings was with the banks and what have you. That was his end of it. Colonel Joe was the rancher and a showman, but primarily a rancher. And Zach was the cattleman, horses, cattle, and a showman. In, in those days there, they, it was a, one of the largest diversified ranch in the United States. By that I mean they had their own packing plant, their own cannery, their own light plant, telephone system, banking system. In fact, they paid you in script for their money. Uh, they had, uh, it was all right there together. Uh, it was a, a town within, actually within itself. How big was the ranch? Well, uh, a leased land's land and all, there's this story that um, they got their name from 101 because they had 101,000 acres. Well, I, a lot of that's true as far as the land is concerned, but a lot of it was leased land from the Indians. And uh, the uh, Zach told me personally, in fact, even after the depression got him, I took Zach and Indians out to uh, Amarillo and different places, and uh, he told me personally that uh, he had a cattle drive from Texas, coming up from Old Mexico to Texas. Don't recall the town in Texas, but they got in this bar, and uh, uh, the cowhands all got drunk and tore the place up. And uh, he went in to settle with him, and the guy that owned the saloon gave him 101 different things that they had torn up that he had to pay for and which he took out of their pay. And uh, that kind of stuck with him 101. Actually, it was Miller Brothers prior to that. And then it developed into Miller Brothers 101 Ranch, real Wild West in Great Far East. That's when they brought the Arabs and such in, and the tumblers and what have you. You know, when I was in San Antonio, I was talking to some people, and they said that happened in San Antonio. I yes. heard that story down yes. there, and they said it was in San Antonio where that happened. Yes. With the barn and everything. Yes. Uh, but uh, the legend goes now that uh, 101,000 acres, so... Incidentally, John Dahl, the senator, he was adopted this place here, you know. Senator Dahl has that. This yeah, is from Barnesville. Yeah, this is his baby here. And uh, he uh, uh, told me that it was either April the 21st or the 22nd, they're taking the uh, Miller Brothers into the Cowboy Hall of Fame. Most of the books I've read are poorly written, haven't lived on the ranch. They made movies there, silence. I haven't watched it, but those actors and actresses wanted the music, the background music, no, it was not recorded. Who are some of the actors you played for? Uh, Virginia Warwick, uh, Jack Mulhall. They were all uh, 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 pretty well noted in the movie industry in those days. Uh, we lived at the White House on the third floor when uh, we uh, had it there. Uh, let's see.
March 8th, 1983. This is Joe Todd, interview with Mr. Frank Marshall. Mr. Marshall, when were you born? August 19th, 1900. Where were you born? There's some, uh, Sandra Dahl was telling me that this lady was going to come up and she's a buff on She's writing a story, or I really I don't know exactly, on uh, uh, Wild West shows, which at one time there was quite a few, and uh, uh, rodeo cowboys and such. And there, I was in the 101. Sometime during the year, the outstanding uh, cowboys uh, would uh, would be on there maybe for two or three months and uh, see back years ago trick riding and trick roping was contested it uh, now it's a uh, contract but back then it was uh, it, it was years ago it was contested it was yes it sure was uh, in fact world's champion uh, uh, was from Mulhall uh, Byers, Chester Byers. Yeah. Um, Did he work in the Boho Ranch? Yeah. Yeah, he, uh, see, it was Colonel Zach Mulhall that took Will Rogers to New York that got, that's how Will Rogers got his start and went with the uh, Zig Theo Parley's uh, as a roper. You did the big loop, the big loop circle with the the, uh, the, the rods dancing in and out and such as that. And then you got to be a talking entertainer and what have you. And uh, uh, Colonel Zach was a uh, cattle buyer for the Frisco Railroad. It's Mulhall or Miller? Mulhall. Mulhall. Mm -hmm. I knew him real well. And Lucille, she was, you know, you know she was number one roper in all of them. What was she like, Miss Hill? She was, uh, I drove for her. She was uh, uh, just another person, nothing braggadocious about her. She uh, two-fisted drinker, that between you and me, and uh, she, uh, uh, she liked to shot in the arm once in a while too. She she was pretty much a two-fisted breaker. Colonel Zach Millard Mulhall uh, died. They found her dead in the gutter down the city. And the story that they told up there the natives, and if you knew Millard, she was supposedly the daughter of Teddy Roosevelt. When he came down here, coyote hunting, and uh, he, she had the teeth identical, identical, whether she was or not. But, I don't know, but that was the natives up there around there. And Bill Panty from Mulhall was in charge of the Indians on the ranch show. Uh, he told me that story, and he wasn't a guy that would throw throw you a line. When did Teddy Roosevelt come down here? In the early, very early days, uh, whether it was right here or not, I couldn't tell you because it really was never, under interest never went into it. I, I was at Colonel Zach's funeral in uh, my home and uh, I was uh, out of state when uh, but no, I was I was at the ranch when Colonel Joe had come up monoxide gas out in his garage. George was killed. He come in from by train and with his car and the ice was on the curb on the old road that isn't in there anymore. Wrecked his car and killed him. Zach died with cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, where's the Moho family buried? Well, I don't know, but to start with, that well, I'll 
call it a mausoleum that set out from the house out there, uh, there. But uh, as I understand, later years they were moved to a cemetery. Is that, um, let me see, they built this little mausoleum for Logan Ball Hall. Right. Is it still out there? I really don't know how many it used to be. Who owns that site now? With that the I Jones? couldn't tell you. Uh, I know it was Squire Johnson there. He, uh, he was a district judge. He played in the band. and uh, Him and his brother laid the town of Billings out and, and what have you. And uh, we was there to, uh, uh, up there to see them. And uh, Mrs. Mulhall was... Uh, real ill and uh, the Santa Fe engine was sitting there and the one of the engineers fireman went up and said whoop whoop with the whistle motioned us over and talked to us quite a while. I wanted to know how Mrs. Mulhall was. Because back in those days they, they those people especially and those locals got acquainted. Mm -hmm. um, how big was the White House? Oh three floors in a basement. I lived on the top floor. And uh, it was uh, actually up the third floor on the side of the restroom was practically all one just one open room. And uh, the uh, second floor was uh, bedrooms. Uh, it was quite large. We had pictures here. And uh, the uh, bottom floor was a uh, dining room, a big vault like a bank would have. And uh, uh, a wet bar in the living room. And two bedrooms to the north. It was about oh, five or six bedrooms on the second floor. Yeah. How come it burned? What was the reason? Well, see, uh, it burnt in the early days, and then they rebuilt the one that was there. And then, uh, truthfully, I can't tell you what happened to the uh, this last one, kind of lost track on it, and uh, they uh, the depression got them, uh, like along with a lot of others, and that land sold. There was one the red something, fifteen nine hundred acres. And Crown audit. That land went for thirty-five dollars an acre. Anything left to the ranch now? Except nothing except the store. The store. So they uh, they used to have a big rodeo grounds there, and. Uh, along with everything else. Well, it was a town within itself. This rodeo meets, they, that was bought from uh, the Miller Brothers. It was a, an, an arc city, you know, it folded here a month or so ago because of union troubles and notice in the paper now it's reopening. It, uh, it, uh, they were, I remember an instance that the first year the show went out in 25, Colonel Joe was talking to us. It was the first thousand dollar bill I'd ever got to see. And he reached in his pocket and pulled a stack out like this. And he said, you know, there's a lot of these things that goes out and they don't know who's going to bring them back. But he said, this is going to bring this one back. It was the first thousand dollar bill and he had a like oh, that. About an inch thick. Uh, I think he said he, he had a hundred of them there. Uh, 
So did you go out with the show in 25? Yeah. What did you do? Band. What was it like traveling with a one-on-one show? Same as any other. You slept in the same berth every night. Uh, so you had, uh, what, kind of like Pullmans? On the yeah, train? they were Pullmans. They were Pullmans. Oh, yeah. yeah. You slept in the same bed every night. You, you ate uh, in the same cookhouse every night, or every day, rather, at the same table. Uh, the average family couldn't have afford to feed as well as they do, did there. And uh, uh, it was just like working here. No different, because you rode the same crane, the same bird, you worked under the same tent, it, and uh, a lot of times you'd wake up and you wouldn't have a route card, and you, somebody would say, well, what town is this? You always ask the first thing, where's the lot? What's the lot? Showgrounds. And that was the same as anything else. They had the voca vocabulary of, of their own. The side show was a kid show, the big show. The dressing room was a pad room, horse dance and so on. And uh, the, you had a, on the train, you had a, a dining car. And uh, after the show at night, we called it the privilege car or the uh, uh, pie car. You had, uh, and uh, the sideshow band was the jig band, the big show band. Then Colonel Joe went over and brought that Russian band and Russian riders back from the White Russian Army. And you had uh, the Zouab band, which was from here, uh, Zouab drill team and band. And all those bands worked in Grand Entry, or the spec, the spec as we called it. And it was there'd be the big show band, the jig band, the Russian band, and, and the uh, Zua band, along with the the cowboys and cowgirls, and so on like that. How many people were in the grand entry? Around three hundred, three fifty maybe. Yeah. What kind of music did you play for the West Show? Paul West Show. Uh, a lot of gallops. That's one beat from the real fast. And uh, then, see, they had an elk mic. They had, uh, they had the Lentinis. They were Italians, but they worked as Indians. Uh, and uh, with the full war headdress on, and, uh, they were dark complected. Look at you. The, you had, uh, it depends. For instance, the finale on it was the covered wagon one. I mean, they burned it each time. Burnt this cloth over it. The Indians attached it and attacked it, rather, and then the, the cavalry would come in and, and run them out. And uh, to bring it in, oh, Susanna, there was a stock and trade for the uh, covered wagon coming in with the pioneers. And they were in their sunbonnets and what have you. Uh, the Indians would, we had mostly Sioux there from up in the Dakotas. We had very few Oklahoma Indians on there. Uh, I think that was due to the fact that Buffalo Bill, uh, his show being out in Nebraska and later on out of Denver when he's on the South Floto, uh, used those Indians up there and they were experienced show uh, squaws and bucks. Yeah. What would you play when the Indians attacked the wagon? Play the gallop. Uh, hurry up number real fast. And uh, see, and back in those days, the musician, he couldn't play soft and sweet. He had to jam it because you didn't have no mics or anything. That's, yeah. uh, but when I started trooping, the lights were get lights. I was trooping. And show business. Show business. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it was gas lights. Yeah. No electricity. Then they come along and had their own electric plant. Uh, Kenny Kohler and the Mesa put two seasons over on the ranch. So he was just retired out of the bank here. And uh, he 
he's uh, on the board of directors here. You know, the cookhouse, we called it, uh, they had a flag, not the American flag, just a flag. And when that flag was up, that meant the cookhouse was open. If the flag was down, you was out of luck, you couldn't get in. And our, our, our gag anymore is when we see one another, if it's about time to go somewhere and eat, we'll, our conference is a flag up. And, <laughs> and back in the fall of the years, see, they, got, they guide those big tops out every evening. And uh, on the ranch, so see, the arena was open uh, for your rifle shots and so on like that. And when they guided out, they'd sing, and the, and the, the, the Boss Canderson would sing, Some of these days, and they'd say, Some of these days won't be long, won't be long. You look for the flag, look for the flag, and the flag will be gone. <laughs> that was in the fall of the year. Yeah. What was your salary? Uh, forty dollars a week, Buck and Chuck. Buck and Chuck. Yeah, that was wardrobe on the lot, transportation, berth, and meals. We were union. You were union. Yeah. Oh yeah. What union were you a member of? Musicians. Musicians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You still a member? No. No, I don't. Oh, I jobbed in Oklahoma City on that local there. Job playing state fair. Most of those uh, indoor shows coming there bring an organ, drummer, director, use of local musicians, played a lot of those, and uh, the fair, such as that. Yeah. What's your, I guess, favorite memory of the 101 show? Welcome to that. Oh, uh, I don't believe I have one. It was a job. Uh, it was something I'd done for a long time. And uh, I guess the thing I heard, especially in the East, see, we had to wear the big hat and boots. That was everybody. That was as much advertising when you got in town as uh, in the parade. Uh, you take in those neighborhoods, and, but then you rode it either a taxi or a, a streetcar to the lot on the showgrounds. And uh, you would, uh, especially up, up in Canada and those country, these kids would run from you. They, <laughs> they'd been looking at Western movies, silent, I guess, and see those big hats and boots and all up there, colorful shirts and so on that, uh, that would be one of the things I remember real well. It, uh, and see, we, uh, we stayed pretty well with the, the population, the New England states and uh, down that East Coast and all heavily populated. You had to stay where the population was. Did you go to Europe? Never did, not with them, only Navy. Mm -hmm. uh, how long did you work for the 101? Seven years. Till like, what, 29 or 30? 33. 33? Mm -hmm. And that's when it closed? Yeah. And uh, then I went to the Wrangling Show. And uh, the, what, the 101, well, because of depression, hard times? The, the, the depression, done. Where were you when it closed? Uh, oh, 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 oh. Sheen, Wisconsin. Yeah. Was Colonel Miller up there? Oh, yeah. Then we went out. Can you describe that day when it closed? What that day was like? Yeah. It was uh, uh, a lot of them uh, took off from there. They paid, they paid salaries right up to the very last. And uh, they uh, uh, would tell you, there was a lot of handshaking and, and among the 
cow gals and such, and valley broads and what have you. There was a lot of crying. And uh, uh, we pulled back into the ranch and then see, uh, it was in 32, 33, we went to the World's Fair in Chicago. That's when Sally Rand got her, who was next to Sally Rand in their band dance. Uh, they, that was after you left the 101 and went to the Wolf's Fair? That was with the 101. That was with the 101. Yeah. Yeah. Then in 34, I went to the Ringman show. Let me ask, what was your favorite? Did you get to travel to the Wolf's Fair in Chicago? Oh, yeah. Did you see it? What was your favorite display up there? Uh, General Electric. What was the theme of that fair? That's a hell of a good question. Century of Progress. Progress. I haven't thought of that in years. <laughs> Bringing back memories for me. <laughs> how big was that fair? Well, how big of an area? It was tremendous. It was all covered that entire lakefront through. If you've ever been in Chicago, they covered uh, uh, even the uh, Soldier City there was a part of it. Well, it's, oh, yeah. well, I still have that one building, the Museum of Science and Industry, I think, was built for that. Uh, they, uh, it, uh, it was tremendous. It was. Uh, they had uh, uh, restaurants and uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not and shows like that. And but there was a lot of, uh, of like Western Electric, General Electric, and, uh, and this, I remember very distinctly went in there, and uh, there was a steel set on a. Uh, two shoulders. It was a foot square piece of steel. And uh, you would take your finger like that and, and push on it and they would tell you how much you bent it. Huh. It was that sensitive deal on it, yeah. They had a lot of that kind of stuff there. Um, that's where Sally Rand, uh, that's way before your time, Sally Rand got I don't know who she is. Yeah. That, uh, we were right next to Sally's. And if business got a little show, uh, slow she'd have them come and arrest her. That was, uh, she'd make the front pages then, and business would come right on back. Yeah. How long do you stay at the fair? Well, let me see. It lasted about 20 weeks, something like that. Were you doing the whole run of the fair? What was your average attendance? Oh, uh, now that you ask, uh, I would say this is a guest of a thousand. That was. Uh, That's every day? Well, you just didn't run the show. Uh, uh, when one show was over and they cleared out, you start ballet, ballet when they had a ramp that come up and down. The band sat behind it, and the horses, Indians and cowgirls and all, would go up over this ramp where those on the midway could see it. And you depended on the day and the crowds, how many shows you know. What part of the fair did you, did you have an arena built? Oh, yes. Show? Where was it, the arena? It was under canvas. Yeah. How close to the stadium there? Oh, we were on the south end. Uh, God, I never thought of that before. Not too far. That's where we always sit with the radio show, too. Uh, the, uh, I can't my, my entire band got kicked out of the Union in Chicago. Okay. Uh, Jimmy Petrillo. National president. He, uh, in fact, he told 
Franklin Delano Roosevelt to go to hell. He thought he was a tin god. And they would call us down there. Uh, actually, to harass us about the time we'd go to work. And uh, I finally went, he called the entire band down. And uh, we went in his office, and the door didn't have a handle on it. It was open. A switch on the inside. And his desk sat across this way in the corner. And there was a shelf up there. One of his agents sat on each side with a uh, shoulder hose gun and a machine gun up behind him. And there was one of Capone's boys, uh, Diamond Jack Altera, who adopted the show. And uh, Gave a lot of western hats and such as that, belt buckles. And, uh, Jimmy Petrella said, uh, who's in charge of this? No, he said, who's in charge of this man? I said, I am. He said, who in the hell gave you permission to come to Chicago without contacting me? I said, I've been here a lot of times and never did contact you because we're a traveling show. And we don't come under your jurisdiction. He said, by God, you do now. He said, you're not drawing the scale. I said, oh, yeah. Ground traveling scale. That's what we are. It went on and he said, I'll give you three weeks and uh, I'll decide. He said, You're going to give them my scale. And I, I shot right back at him and I said, Well, if we give you all that, uh, I mean, if I pay them all this kind of money, I said, They'll just have to kick it back to me and I'll turn it into office because we don't come. Well, the next day, uh, I'll never forget the agent's name, Jabberoski and uh, Racket. The reason I remember that was named Racket, that's what it was. They came out in business, took it quite a while. And got ready to leave and hand me a, a packet of envelopes and said to give these to the boys. And uh, it was our dismissal from the union. Well, this Diamond Jack out here who was later killed, and he called him, I was there, and uh, he gave him, uh, he didn't call Diamond Jack. Uh, he said, uh, Jimmy, the band with the 101 Ranch Show and her friends of mine, and I want you to look out for them. You understand what I mean? And hung up. We weren't bothered again. Somebody threw a, threw a firecracker in that bomb, in that band. We'd all got stopped and danced stop off the death. <laughs> yeah. So you went to work for the Ringling Show in '34. Mm -hmm. In the band. <laughs> no, no, not the band. Uh, in '34, I had a four people bell act in the side show. And that's where I did my inside leg. Four people what? Musical, a bell act, a musical bell act. Oh. Cathedral chimes, Swiss bells, and all that kind of stuff, yeah. Inside show? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How long did you work there? I was there two seasons. Then, uh, what happened? Then, 36. Uh, Bill Isley of Tulsa put out the Bailey Brothers circus over there. And uh, I took the band on there, big show announcer. And uh, and that fall I come in, he had a house show, his daughter, Phyllis Isley, who is now Jennifer Jones. Uh, she was married this to Bob Walker. I did uh, advance for him then. And he was giving him some. That was for a uh, theater a dramatic show. Were times pretty hard in those those days, the thirties? Oh, uh, when the uh, when the depression hit, yes, because your business is one of the worst things hit. 
What was your average attendance then? You know, like on the run the show? Yeah. Oh. Um, it seated uh, you know, about 11,000 people. Your afternoon show would be maybe half capacity, night show maybe two thirds capacity. That seems, that seems pretty good for a hard time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did you know Emmett Kelly? Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, just to sit around and throw the bow with him, you know, on the lot on Sunday, and if you weren't showing, what was he like? Like you or me. Uh, very uh, reserved and, uh, and set, and, and uh, talk about maybe the old days or something like that. How come he never smiled? He did if you knew him personally. No, in his clown act. That was part of it. That was part of it. That's what they call pen and face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, uh, yeah. That well, we had the Emmett Kelly Museum up in, uh, I think, Caney, Kansas. It was his hometown. Uh, well, yeah, I don't know. Uh, uh, the band director on the ring of the show for 51 years. Sarasota Florida now. And uh, I got to see him up there at Baraboo, Wisconsin, about every year. He'd always show up like we'd try to arrange it so we'd get there and maybe there'd be maybe four or five other band directors there. Last summer I went to, I had to, around the summer before I was at the North Platte in uh, Nebraska, the Buffalo Bills. It's real nice. And the one that, uh, Cody Wyoming is super. It is something. Um, it's four, real big. It's four divisions. One is Buffalo Bills. One is all the Winchesters, uh, guns they were made. One is the Indians, and the other is the Indians. It's all separated there. So it's super. The one in North Platte is, see, the last two years, and he, he was on 101 back in the day. When Jess Woodard had it in uh, 16 and 17. Wait, well, Buffalo Bill? Yeah. What did he do with him? Really, he was very playful, and you'd have to help him on the horse and help him off. All he done was make grand entry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. See, this time I'm on the Denver Post, signed him up for the photo show, sells photo. That's Buffalo Bill. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> in his contract, he agreed not to take that he was a two-fisted drinker and a ladies' man, over th three drinks a day. And that's all he took, but he, uh, he got him a nice tea glass and he filled it full. And that was his three drinks <laughs> a day, was three iced tea glasses full. <laughs> what did he drink? Bourbon. Bourbon. Yeah. When did he die? Oh, I've been to his grave too, I forget. Up there at Lookout Mountain? Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I really, I don't, uh, 
It had to be about 19, 18 or 19, right in there somewhere, mm -hmm. not, there, not later than 20. Yeah. He, uh, and he didn't want to be buried there. He, he wanted to be buried at Cody. So, now at North Platte, they're very honest. They, they don't draw no punches on him. They, they tell about this prince or something he had in, a, in England, because he oh, he was very popular there. And uh, he spent $85,000 on her. He, uh, they, they, uh, there at North Platte, they, they can't tell it just exactly like he is. His home's there. In his barn, where they always had big barns where they kept all their wagons and equipment and uh, rodeo grounds, and then the museum. And uh, they had a, they put on about a 20 minute motion picture there that Edison took of the 101 Ranch and he used those pictures to get his uh, a patent on his motion picture camera and said it was the size of a piano. How come he wasn't buried in Cody? Uh, he died there in Denver, and uh, uh, Tamman, who owned the uh, Denver Post, made all arrangements, and he, he was broke. And uh, he wanted Buffalo Bill there. They were bitter enemies. He hated Tamman's guts, and rightly so. Uh, they uh, he took the two times a cell show and a photo show and combined them. That's the same as the Ringling Brothers. And Barnum and Bailey, the Ringling Show was out of Baraboo, Wisconsin, then out of, uh, yeah, out of Baraboo. And the uh, uh, Barnum and Bailey was out of Bridgeport, Connecticut. And they bought the uh, title and uh, combined them. And they also bought that title, The Greatest Show on Earth. And uh, they uh, uh, combined the two. The show was uh, 100 cars. That's, it was still 100 cars on the Ringman show, four sections. And uh, the first section we were always on that was comprised of the cookhouse and the sideshow and things like that because uh, if it was a late arrival, you had to feed the people and you had to, those, we call them lot lice, those people that uh, if it was a little late for the show, why well, use the sideshow to pick up additional money and, and keep them entertained while, uh, while that was slow going on. How big was uh, the Barnum and Bailey show? It was it was a car a circus of about sixty cars. So they joined with. They actually all they done they bought it and all they done was just put the title Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey. They just really all they done was add the Barnum and Bailey. Now who was Ringling? They were four brothers out of Baraboo, Wisconsin, Germans. And somewhere I've got a picture of them. And uh, they started out as a wagon show. That's what our the Marshall Brothers was. And uh, then they went to the railroad shows. Uh, they made millions of dollars. The, the theater still runs in Baraboo. You talk about a beautiful theater. It's out of the, I went to a picture show there. It's then in 1919 when they combined the two because of weather conditions, they moved to Sarasota, Florida, mm -hmm. which was the time they moved there was just a fishing town. And you know, now, when did the Ringling Brothers come to Oklahoma? Oh, they used to. Oh, different times. Well, you know the town of Ringling. Southern Oklahoma you know, was named for well, that. They used to they had, down there. The reason of that was that they had uh, they helped bankroll that railroad into it, and it was a boom town, oil town, Ringling, 
Oklahoma was, and they took it because they owned the biggest share of the railroad, and they took the Ringling Brothers' name for Ringling, Oklahoma. That it was a boom town, and it had a new name, and that's where they got it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, who was Bailey? Oh, uh, I don't know. It was uh, a partner that uh, P.T. Barnum had with over the years, or what have you. And uh, uh, with so many of those titles, uh, sales for for Paul. Uh, there was a jillion titles, and I was on the John Robinson show, and. Uh, it was a southern show, although we made uh, the New England states and into the south. Uh, and uh, they, so many of those had their own, own territory. They, uh, they didn't, uh, for instance, uh, Harry James, you know, uh, they were, Everett James was, uh, one of the shows, Christie's show, was out of Ada, Oklahoma. And uh, Everett, that, that, the, uh, the Christie's, were, they were cousins. And Harry was born on the Hague show, which was a, in our language, a mud show, cross country. And his name is Harry Hague. That was his two given names. And uh, it was... Uh, Royal Texas, uh, Molly Bailey. She uh, she owned all the lots she showed on through Texas. Instead of going in and renting them, she just bought them. Uh, but the uh, it was a there was so many of them. It was like I was telling you a while ago. You uh, uh, you knew somebody on all of them. It, and the feature acts, uh, like the Willandos at uh, the High Wire Act, and one of them was killed down there, you know, fell off a walk of one boom to another, and Otto, you know. And uh, acts like that, the flying acts, the flying wards, and uh, they, they were primarily on shows like uh, the. Uh, John Robinson, the, the American Circus Corporation, they owned uh, John Robinson. They bought and finally acquired John Robinson, Hagenbach Wallace, Sparks, Alzie Barnes, and Sells Floto. And then Ringling bought all those titles and rolling stock and such to, to cut down on competition. Mm -hmm. They had the money, kind of money they could do it with. Now you say the wagons up in Wisconsin are the wagons from the 101 show? There's uh, the covered wagon and bandwagon there, and the three flat cars that they load and unload each morning is from the 101 range. And uh, they have, uh, in fact, uh, my family is the in there is the only family. Uh, Merle Evans, who was a band director on the Ringling Show, and Otto Grebling, the clown, his first name, er, er, Merle, and then ours, uh, all of our musical instruments and pictures of the Marshall Brothers Circus and uh, the handbills, they, they, they've they got it all there. Yeah. Did you work in the Marshall Brothers Circus? No, I was too young. Yeah. When did your father and your uncles start that? In... Uh, Oh, hell, I got a book on it down there. Uh, in about 97. Was that in, in where they where they organized? Of Oakland, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and here, uh, when my granddad came here, one of the guys that worked for him, Betra Renane, was buried here. And uh, Earl... Always oh, seems strange to me, you know, you call Mother Eb. But hell, it was, 
young folks together and work together. Uh, my uh, my mother was on it, and uh, my aunt. Uh, and then, you see, prior to that, dad was in the in a big show band, and his brother Mike had, they had white bands in the side shows, and Mike had the side show band. Uh, the, uh, oh, it goes back, and I tell you, it did me good, though. When I joined, I said I joined the Navy when I was 42, <laughs> and the uh, Navy Seabees, uh, and I didn't, I, uh, I joined it originally on uh, my construction engineering business, and uh, they uh, found out that I was a band director, and I wound up with a band there, a Navy band. Thought I had it made. We got on Guadalcanal, that was our first invasion, and uh, then our second invasion was the New Georgia group and we stacked our instruments and, and they gave us letters and going in and picking carrying the wounded out. So you went to Guadalcanal or New Georgia then? Yeah. Where'd you go? You joined the Army and the Navy in nineteen forty two? Right. Decoration Day. Forty two. Uh what'd you, what'd you go through basic? Norfolk. Boot camp there. Boot camp? Mm -hmm. And you were an engineer? I'm a materials engineer, yeah. What's that? Well, all the materials that goes into a building or a highway and all is pre-tested and uh, certified to, as to being even to the, on the highway after they're mixed concrete, asphalt, or what have you. That. Uh, okay. Then when did you get the band? The Navy band? Yeah. Uh, I was in the Navy about three weeks. <laughs> I do it. Mm -hmm. This skipper called me in and uh, said, uh, it's no, no instruments, nothing. So said, Do you think if uh, we uh, gave you the money that you could go to into Los Angeles, we jumped, we was five days in Gulfport and then to the West Coast, and get the instruments? And I said, Yes. Lieutenant Commander Hunter was sitting there and he said, uh, you think you can produce a band? I said, yeah, sure do. Yes, sir. He said, well, how do you know you can? And he said, and I said, well, you know, I'm just an enlisted man. And if I don't, you're the officer in charge. You can do with me just about what you want to. I said, you got me over a barrel if I don't. The old man hit his leg and said, that's the right answer. So they sent me into Los Angeles with uh, a Lieutenant J.G. Jones, who's back Bay, Boston. And he was looking at instruments by price. I was looking at condensed condition and whether they were usable or not. And we came back, we didn't have nothing. Over our officer was named Brown. I went to him and I said, I'd like to be relieved from this sir. Told him the circumstances. He said, uh, If I, uh, I incidentally had two cousins on me. And I said, He said, If I send you back uh, without him, would you be willing to go? I said, Yes. I said, If you let me take the, both of them were good musicians. I said, Let me take who I want with you. And not try to. Tell me I can't stay but 48 hours or to, until I get it done. He said, I'll take care of it. Come back in a little while. And he said, pick your men and give me their names and get started. And uh, we went into uh, Los Angeles and went to hawk shops, music stores. What I bought, what I bought for a balanced band. I didn't, uh, didn't buy for what I, the men I had or what, I bought for a balanced band and then I had to switch them around. A battle, battle band? Uh, a balanced. Oh, balanced band. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I wanted at least uh, my trumpets and, and reed instruments and baritone basses and so on mm -hmm. balanced out. And 
uh, through Ignors, I bought uh, a lot of uh, reeds and pads and stuff like that. And when we got to the South Pacific Way, hell, I had them. And, and I didn't even know where we were going. And it was a mystery that we had that had an abundance of them. But anyway, I had a Jewish boy uh, play the piano. I put him on clarinet. His name was uh, Loeb. He came to me and he said, uh, if uh, you'll get me a pass to Oklahoma City, I'll bring us a piano back. I said, now, Lowe, he said, you just get me a pass in there. And I, I got here in about three days, here came this truck pulling in with a piano. <laughs> He'd gone to some, well, waved a flag and came back with a, with a, with a piano. And you the still, only, were you still in Los Angeles at that time? Uh, at, uh, uh, at Gulf, I mean, at, uh, up by Vallejo, and uh, he's about 60 miles up there in Camp Parks. And, uh, and uh, the old man wrote a letter. Nobody could give me or a member of my band an order except him. And that was the only way that I could, uh, you know, try to sign him a duty when. Some of them hadn't touched the instrument in 15 years, but I had 11 guys there that named bands, big bands, so I couldn't keep them up in the band. Um, and uh, we uh, we rehearsed. I started out with this simple third grade music. First thing was to get their lips worked up. And uh, we had a good band. In, uh, we were the only American band in the South Pacific to start with. We were it. We were in constant demand. New Caledonia. Uh, it, we'd play there on Guadalcanal and uh, maybe get started and condition ran to start and everybody tear to the foxholes and, and uh, all clear and sound and come back and maybe you'd get interrupted two or three times during a, during a concert. But, uh, Were you there during the invasion? Guadalcanal? Yeah, right afterwards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, then we went into the New Georgia on Monday. We beat the Marines in there. Uh, ship we was on got sunk in McCauley. And Are you on board when it was sunk? Just got off of it. Just got off of it. And uh, Funny thing happened, a guy I'd worked with for years. And we got to talk and he was telling me about uh, being on a can escort to the Macaulay. And I looked at him. I said, You run this escort up in New York? He said, Yeah. He said, Was you on the Macaulay? We'd known one of those. It was the first time I knew that, uh, that uh, he, he, he was. Uh, on a can there. And you say that you had to stack your instruments and pick up power? Oh, no, that's a statement. We, uh, we lived uh, we, there. We had pup tents and uh, what instruments you had, you had kept under there. And, and uh, we played when you could. And uh, you, 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 right with your pup tents, you had a, a box hole that you, when, uh, when Condition Red was sounded, why? Uh, you would, uh, and that was every night. It was Nixon Ways, Washington Machine Charlie. And uh, you uh, actually, the climatical conditions was uh, worse than the jabs. Mm -hmm. uh, them old lazy boys, those sea bags, and they wouldn't get in them for two or three weeks. And when they did, they'd just be a solid mass of green. Uh, and uh, and at night nothing moved naturally. How long you on uh, New Georgia? Uh, <coughs> well, I was on uh, 
Port Canal until it was secured and was on uh, the New Georgia until it was secured. Did you ever have to go into combat? No, uh, uh, our job was picking up the wounded. You know? In fact, there's a boy, well, he was in Stillwater now. We was, I had three Higgins, both those nine barges, and we'd, uh, we'd go and get them, bring them in there, load them in there and bring them in. Somebody hit me on the shoulder and said, you Frank Marshall? Yeah. Said, I'm Bill Deaver, and he tried to tell me all in one breath. Been there on the front line, blah, 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 blah. Got him some clean clothes and some cigarettes, because there were cigarettes from over there in the cans because of humidity. And some candy and got him on a, an LST going back down below. Damn if he didn't, he took him down there, patched him up, and he got wounded again. <laughs> I see him every once in a while. Yeah. Yeah. When did you get your discharge from the Navy? Nineteen forty. Well, I put eighteen months in the Navy hospitals. Well, with your band? No, as a patient. As a patient. Yeah. What happened? This leg and I had malaria twenty some times and uh, psychoneurosis, combat fatigue, which you used to call shell shock, I guess, <laughs> and. Uh, Cat fever and uh, jungle rot around uh, my grinds in my face. And, uh, were you in what hospital were you in? I was in uh, from, uh, sent me back from New Jersey to Guadalcanal to Esprito Santos to New Caledonia to New Zealand to Okno. To San Diego, back to Pete C, the city at uh, uh, there by Livermore, California. What'd you do on VJ Day, Japanese Olympic? Not much. Not much. Uh, I, uh, it didn't, uh, we knew it wasn't going to happen, just a matter of time. Uh, when they landed us in New Zealand, these guys from Vietnam cried about the way they were treated. The uh, New Zealand band was playing and the brass was shaking our hands. I was in the litter, I was carrying a sword. And uh, when we landed in stateside, uh, an old dark war, the uh, uh, had some buses there. I was an ambulatory man, and uh, all right, hey Mac, get your ass over here, snap it up. And they talked about reception when they got back. Well, hell, state was it? We didn't think it was just part of it. We was home at least, and then, as far as I was concerned, just getting back home was was all I'd give him. And the doctor asked me in there, he said, what are you doing in here at your age? And I said, I'm the guy that confused ignorance and patriotism. Scared to death he wouldn't take me, and I'm scared to death now he's not going to let me out. <laughs> oh, I had words in there. With, I had words uh, with the doctor in New Zealand. They sent me to a denture laboratory, an office rather. And what few teeth I had left, they... Uh, told me I need to have them extracted. And I said, do you have a natural laboratory here? Oh, not yet. And uh, the next morning, uh, the corpsman came by and said, did you know he was being in the dam, supposed to be in the dam office? I said, yes. He said, do you refuse? And I said, yes. He said, uh, just a minute. He run the doctor's making sick call. And here he come. He said, uh, I understand you refused to go to the dental office. I said, I said, yes, sir. He said, why? And I said, well, one reason, I'm too nervous. Another one is, you don't have a natural laboratory here. He said, oh, he said, what well, makes you nervous? I said, this very words I said, I said, if you got hit in the ass like I did with a goddamn bomb fragment, you wouldn't ask those silly questions. 
and he'd wear on the neck, and the next morning the corpsman come in and said, look what you got, look what you got. And I said, what is it? He said, T-U-S. And I said, what does that mean? I said, transfer to the United States. That was the smartest thing I ever said. <laughs> and uh, I had a doctor in San Diego. I forget his name, Lyons. He was J.G. intern. He came by and said, Cole, all I said to him was, I said, Doctor, could I have some quinine instead of Adamant? I said, I've taken so much of it, it makes me sick. He said, I am the doctor here. I will diagnose and I will prescribe. And I said, you son of a bitch, you would make a good bet <laughs> And I don't know why I made him mad. <laughs> uh, that was like the day after tomorrow, they shipped me back to Treasure Island. My wife was out there. San Francisco. Yeah, they shipped me from San Diego without any physical anything. It's because they just put on my papers transfer back to active duty. I told my wife, I said, now, when I tell you to call the conductor, you call him. I got me a fifth. And I knew if I'd done that, I'd, that malaria had hit me. I found out, because I go out of my head one day, about a hot temperature, about 105. I said, okay, call them. They took me off in Tracy, California. And uh, wouldn't take my wife. We finally got back together and uh, took me to, uh, to uh, Livermore, the naval base. And uh, put me in there. I got, I, I, swear, I got a medical from there. I had a hundred percent disability and I got my first check and I didn't even know what the hell it was. And when I took it to the Legion service office and I asked him, what the hell is this check for? I looked at it and he said, hell, it's compensation. I still draw 60%. So, mm -hmm. After the Navy, what did you do? <clears throat> went back to the state. You went back to the Highway Patrol. You went back to the Highway Patrol. Yeah. When did you start working for when they started. When was that? 1937. So you were in the first high patrol? That's right. What'd you do when you first started working for? Uh, everything from driving the governor to I taught in the first two patrol schools. And uh, then when I came back, I went with, uh, out of the service, I went to the Bureau of Criminal Investigation. Why did they organize a highway patrol? Pardon? Why did they organize a highway patrol? It was started as a courtesy patrol. That's what it was really intended for to start with. Bud Gentry, Commissioner from England, whom I knew real well, in fact, uh, the day that uh, Governor Marlin signed the bill for the Department of Public Safety, that's the day that Bob Owens, Bud Gentry, and myself went down to 10th and Broadway at that northwest corner building, that four-story building. That was the original headquarters for the Highway Patrol. And at that time, it had the uh, Bureau of Investigation and uh, Automobile Registration in the Highway Patrol. When you first went to work for them, you said that you taught. Yeah. Was that the first thing you did with them? Well, there was no troopers yet because it was a first school. Yeah. What did you teach them? Uh, it, it depended on, uh, uh, I would say primarily we had a trooper from uh, Tubbs from uh, Michigan and one from Maryland as instructors, and we used uh, a couple of, it was at the University of Oklahoma, the schools were, and uh, I would, uh, actually, what I would say that uh, primarily a coordinator on classes, introductions, master of ceremonies, maybe you could put it on the different ones, it was, uh, uh, we brought in different peace officers and teaching pistol shooting and what have you, and uh, one of the t things that 
my principal uh, talk, talk was uh, on their personal habits in public, uh, in a restaurant of uncovering, uh, and uh, that, that they were continuously, they were new, they were in uniform, they would be new in the community, they didn't know people, and their conduct and, uh, and so on was one of my principal uh, talks. Yeah, sure it was. You taught there two years? Two schools, yeah, the first two schools. How long were you in school? Oh, six weeks. Then what you do with the twelve? Put them on the road. Hey, after the first two schools, what you do? Uh, I went uh, uh, number one man to the commission. What's that? Whatever, uh, whatever he, wherever he wanted to go, or whatever he wanted to do, or if they called for the from the governor's office and wanted Mrs. Marlin to take him out to Nichols Hills or what that uh, that was uh, mm -hmm. primarily uh, and picking up uh, we we would get naturally uh, on uh, suitable characters that uh, would come in and try to tell the county attorney how to run his office and, and so on like they couldn't combine the book and and couldn't combine the common sense with the book and their teachings. Yeah. I'd have to go. I remember one I went down to Ada and got uh, John Hancock, Russell with Annie. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> his name was John Hancock? Yeah, he was a big bruiser. He'd drive right along with me, say, Feel my leg hard, or feel this arm like that. And I thought, I'd get you in because I knew he's done. And uh, at the hotel, Nicholson at 8th and Broadway, I took him in and got him in the room. And I said, no, I'll take, I'll have to have your uh, gear and everything for this is settled. He gave it all to me. And I went up, I had a secretary, Cordelia Scott, and I had uh, Scotty type out uh, his mm -hmm. formal dismissal. And I went back to the hotel and gave the porter 50 cents to take it up and give it to him. <laughs> I was going to go up and take it up. You say you're the number one man for the commission. Well, I wasn't officially that, but that's what I was. Yes. Who, yeah. was, who was the first commissioner? Bud Gentry, Jam Gentry, Zena. It was his baby. He. He's the one that got pushed it through the state legislature. He ever on patrol? No. Um, what kind of car did you have? Oh, uh, Forge. We had some Hudsons. I was on bank robber chases and having our buckles. Uh, and, uh, I was riding Ron and Dale Petty and we were riding together. They'd robbed the bank at Paola. They'd taken this Indian's car away from him, tied him to a tree. His name was Jesse James. <laughs> and uh, uh, we uh, had been down there that evening, just as we come up over the hill. They'd taken the banker and his wife hostage. and. Uh, he pulled up beside him, and the banker's wife said, "You just took over the hill. You just missed him. You just missed him." Petty reached over and shook hands with him and said, "We just missed him." <laughs> uh, what were some of the most in interesting cases besides that one mm -hmm. that you were? Oh, the tornado at uh, Cyclone at Woodward, the flood at uh, Muskogee. The when was that flood at Muskogee? What year? Oh, hell. You get into years with me. Uh, about 38, I think. Uh, a tornado at Pryor. That's when uh, Gentry ran the Red Cross out of Muskogee. How come? A couple of things. He was at Woodward. Uh, 
they drive them up in their station wagons and their uniform. The Salvation Army does the work. Uh, I remember we was there in this temporary headquarters and this big shop from the Red Cross and then Gentry and said he had to get back to St. Louis. He said, I'm gonna get back across the river. And Gentry said, like you got over here. Well, and the prior issued orders, those roadblocks not to let any of them through. I was out at Woodward for that one, I'm telling you, almost two weeks. Okay. That's 47. That was the big yeah, one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, buried three children out there in town, no bigger than that, that uh, never was identified. Uh, mm -hmm. Had an instance there on that, Joan Gay Croft. I talked to the guy that took her to the basement of the church. It's still a mystery out there. It comes up every so often. And uh, took her to the basement of the Methodist church. His name was Kramer. She had a shingle blown through her leg. And that was the last whereabouts of her that uh, uh, they uh, knew of her. And uh, about oh, every two or three years, that will that story revives. It's, uh, it's she had a uh, shingle through her leg? Uh -huh. That's what this Kramer told me. Mm -hmm. And she disappeared. Yeah, and we, uh, see, there was a lot of confusion. They flew so many of them in here, some to Wichita, and uh, trying to find uh, uh, this one and trying to find that one. People would come out there, and uh, we had them in a, a building there, and they put long handle underwear on them, and as fast as they was, uh, identified, a tag was tied to their toe. So you could walk along with it. Was, it was stacked on each side. And uh, we looked for, I'll call her Aunt Ann. Well, when she checked, they checked her, she gave her full name, but everybody knew her as Aunt Ann. Like I never found her. Uh, and uh, one woman, uh, I remember we was trying to find, she was nine months pregnant, couldn't locate her anywhere. And hell, she was here in the University Hospital. Uh, but there was so many of them, there was a lot of confusion. But I, I was even judge there, the top of the city hall and jail was blown away and they brought a guy in that had been drunk and I was the judge. I was no more judge than you was. And we heard that the case of the prosecuting attorney who was a highway patrolman, that he was no, no. And uh, I gave him a year in the penitentiary. Uh, I'm gonna suspend it. And uh, if you're brought back up here again, I'm gonna add 10 years to it or whatever it was and just laid it out. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, we never heard of him again. <laughs> How many people were killed in that tornado? A uh, hundred and my figure now is not correct. It's somewhere uh -huh. in the vicinity of 120 or something like that. Possibly a thousand wounded and hurt. Then uh, how come you joined the Navy? I told you. Just take the <laughs> other and patriotism. Quit the Highway Patrol and join the Navy? No, I was with the U.S. Engineers. But when did you start to work for them? Uh, when they started Tinkerfield. Mm -hmm. uh, I went out there. Mm -hmm. Then after the Navy, you went back with the patrol. Went back with the Bureau. Yeah. What did you do with them? I couldn't investigate and such. Uh, and I finally got smart and figured out I wasn't cut out to carry a gun. Went back to the highway department where I belonged. But... Uh, What'd you do with them? Materials engineer. Okay. Work state. Well, I didn't work in the division. I worked in the entire state. You had to go back to your music? Uh, some. Uh, yeah, uh, jobs some. Not a whole lot. And it got conflicting with my work. And uh, 
I, um, oh, now I, I would, uh, when the Doki's there, which is the Ninth of Pins, and the Shriners, and I belong to the Knights of Columbus. <laughs> uh, and uh, on their parades and all, they would call, yeah, and I would, uh, I would get the camp work to help with them play uh, concerts and uh, parades and stuff like that. But getting back to Perry, see, in those days, in the early days here, you made your own entertainment. Uh, it, uh, the merchants, the postmaster, and the groceryman, and all, and that was the people in the band. There was no high school band. I started a high school orchestra, I guess, and well, they got a picture of it here. Uh, and uh, I guess it was the first musical organization that they ever had in the, had in the school. Uh, and, uh, but the, uh, it was, used to be where on a Sunday the, after church the women would bring covered dishes and they'd gather at a home and the, the women would get in and quilt and the men would sit out in the yard in the summertime and tell lies and then, and in the evening they'd roll the carpet back and have a square dance. And, uh, and things of that kind, uh, it was, uh, there's six miles, it's still active, six miles north of here. This was a large Bohemian German settlement. Six miles north of here is the Bohemian Hall yet. And uh, they was a dance there Saturday night. Uh, we'd go out there and play a dance when I was just a kid. And uh, then at long about 11.30, they'd, you started at sundown. And uh, they'd... Uh, spread this table out and everybody go out their buggies and wagons and bring in uh, uh, the food and put it on the table. After they got through eating, they'd clear it away and then uh, they'd dance and we wouldn't quit until it was time for home to, to go home and do the chores. Yeah. Uh, then later on, we got they'd take us out in an automobile. And back then, the, all those old Germans and Bohemians would uh, would be there with their home brew and uh, their homemade wine, and they'd go out and have a drink out there. Never had none of it inside. You know? And uh, what do you take that boy and all their you from? It's still the same one. You know? uh, this this was quite a. This guy uh, wrote this book, Pride of the Prairie. Perry. It's. Uh, Sort of lousy done it. Uh, uh, I'm the only one that knew a lot of hell stuff he put in there that my father taught here in Bohemian Polish and such. He dad was a linguist and uh, uh, he didn't have to teach me hell. That was that was what there was a lot of around here, uh, especially farmers. And he, as a dentist, he catered to the farmers because they paid their bills. Mm -hmm. And in the depression. They bartered, they bring chickens and what have you, uh, for dental. No mm -hmm. money, but uh, they'd bring their, uh, get a pig and a cow and a, what have you. That was mm -hmm. the crap that he, he put in about uh, Supreme Justice, Marshall and such. And hell, uh, stuff in there on us that uh, was ridiculous. Uh, it was just as screwed up as anything I ever read. Um, no. But, you know, really, uh, most of the stuff that I read are things that I'm familiar with. Uh, is badly written. Now, this Bill Pickett out here's story is, uh, is good. The black cowboy? Yeah. I was the ranch when Bill got kicked to the horse. Did you know him? Bill oh, yeah. What was he like? He was a nigger. He was a gentleman. He never was other than black. Never other than black. No. Mm -hmm. He was... Uh, Did he work on the 101? That's where he got his start. Was it is? Yeah. Uh, and he, 
his wife babysat with uh, Miller's children. Now, Bill Pickett was a gentleman. And of all the publicity that he had, he never got other than Bill Pickett. That's right. He sure did not. Uh, and not, not another Cowboy Hall of Fame. To me, they, it's mostly paintings. And what the hell did those uh, cowboys in, in uh, the movies do? They, they just imitated what they had heard about the West. It, it's not to me, I, I, uh, I, I, don't, uh, I don't see it at all. It's, uh, uh, it's, I've been to it once. No, I've been to it twice. We had a neighbor reunion uh, here. I got it here last year. Kansas City this year, year before Birmingham, different places, and uh, uh, I took a bunch of those out there. We had them out. Since then, I had five members of my band there, and uh, uh, they're not knowing the West, they get from the East. It's fine, but uh, to me, the cowhands that I knew, and I'm talking about cowhands. Our, our rodeo hands now are athletes. They go to school and learn. Back in my day, the cow hands learned it on farms and ranches. They, they were really honest to God, uh, cowboys. And uh, the, the trick riders and all learned it out in the pasture. Uh, they didn't, uh, and the ropers learned it out in their backyard. It, uh, and now it's, uh, Hell, I don't even go. I, well, I went to the Cheyenne this year, this past year. That's the granddaddy of all. Yeah, the rodeo. Cheyenne Frontier Days. Yeah, it's a fast show. It's a good show. And, uh, um, but that, the guys, not, I, I wouldn't and I couldn't find them. One of the greatest bronc riders I ever knew was Burger Red. His name was uh, Ribbit. And he was, uh, on this Camel Baby Hutchinson show all the time. And uh, he, uh, he had his two boys and his daughter, and she was married to Hank Linton. They were, see, it, even on the circuses, like on the after show or concert day, like on Ringling Brothers, it was a Wild West show. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, Cy uh, Compton always produced that. And there was different producers, California Frank and, and different ones. Burger Red produced that on, the, on this Camel Baby Hutchinson. He wrote a, I saw him ride a rock when he was around 65. And he, uh, he'd been in a prairie fire and he always advertised himself, Burger Red, the ugliest man alive or dead. He had, his face was all scarred from this prairie. He's a small man. And uh, I asked him, I said, Burger, how in the world did you ever get a woman? He said, my wife said she wasn't the ugliest man and he squeaked when he talked. He said, the ugliest man in the county. And he said, I was it. We've been together ever since. But uh, uh, Buff Brady, Hank Turnell, Cowboys, uh, and California Frank, and uh, the Burks, and so on. Honest to God, Cowboys. These guys today. And, and they don't have it. They don't have no wing of that. Uh, that we're really honest to God, Cowboys. Down in the basement, they've got the Cowboys. Stagecoach and stuff like that, but uh, they, they uh, Sills been out there to Dakota. If they want to see, uh, they got it separated to where out there to where if you just all you care about is Buffalo Bill, they got it. You you get that one large wings too, uh, much bigger than this whole building. The wings are out there, and uh, it's uh, it was uh, built with private donations. It's not state owned or nothing. Now that one, that one in Baraboo, Wisconsin, that's State Historical Society of Wisconsin that runs it. In fact, the money they collect on it uh, takes care of the other uh, museums in the state. Yeah. Tab on that's five and a half. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Well, you got enough? What else you want to talk about? Get married? 
Well, I've been married four times. Four times. Yeah. Three of them in show business. One wasn't. Uh, have any kids? I have two children. Two adopted children. Mm -hmm. Daughter lives in uh, Casper, Wyoming. Her husband is a senior person. He's not there for the teapot dome. It was a scandal back in my time. Mm -hmm. And uh, my son is with the largest construction company in the world, I guess, Peter Kiewit. He's got that plant and all set up there on Northeast 50th, about a quarter of a mile east of uh, Northeast 50th of Interstate 35. Mm -hmm. My daughter-in-law teaches school at Midwest City, and she's an art teacher. And uh, my daughter was a year, year old, and my son is two and a half when we adopted him. I was 52 years old when we, when we adopted him. So, and uh, two granddaughters. Lost my last, my wife, and my wife, those others were short-term affairs. <laughs> and, uh, Last one we lived together for 30 years. Mm -hmm. Lost her to leukemia. Uh, I've got a granddaughter going to school at Taft. She's in seventh grade, made Dean's honor roll, or whatever role it is. And, uh, my son followed out my foot tracks around construction. And, uh, I didn't tie it up here, but I, I helped. We built a new track at the stadium out here. And, uh, mm -hmm. It's really up to standard. I've been involved in that in here. And I'm vice commander of the American Legion. And uh, I still have a home up in the city. I live in a motel here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for the last five years. Mm -hmm. Only about 20 steps from, from the coffee shop. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I'm I'm moving in an apartment out here. Now, I came back here because my mom, she passed away four years ago, 105. That's the reason I came back. What was her name? Evelyn Marshall. Uh, everybody knew her around here as grandma. Uh, mentally, right up to Actually, she she was in Brazil and she fell uh, going to the bathroom. It was a minor, but at her age, it uh, it got her. And uh, but right up to last, she was actually my family history. I really got more when I came back here to be with her, because we'd set a thousand evenings and uh, she would. Uh, I would ask questions. We'd reminisce and. Uh, she uh, uh, really brought me to date on uh, on her side of the family, much, and a lot on dad's too. She had a real good memory. But uh, no, uh, this has been my legal residence, even though all the years I was with the Department of Public Safety. In the highway department, I've always and I've always banked at the same bank. Yeah, I sure have. Yeah. Did you ever meet Joseph Fulcart? Who? Joseph Fulcart, the guy that designed the old bank there in Nashville, no. the architect. No, no, no. That belongs to Janice's dad in here, you know. It does. Yeah. 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 No, I didn't. Uh, I I knew the men that had it built. Chris Jensen, Gus Lane, and those, George Foster, and those. I knew them. Uh, Foster was a former United States Marshal. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Lays, and well, the Lays, the younger members are still here, and so is uh, the Fosters. Uh, and uh, the Exchange Bank, it's been in the Hall family, with George Hall is. Uh, board of directors with it. Uh, my family in the halls were real close. No, uh, it took a lot of intestinal fortitude for a lot of those people that stayed at, uh, like the Cremans and uh, the uh, McCoys, the uh, 
Godleaf Brothers run the famous store, Fred Kretz Grocery Store, and uh, like that, uh, they stayed here and built buildings. And, uh, and financially, Perry's in a better shape, thanks to Charles Machine Works out here at Bitchwitch. Then, uh, see, the way things conditions are, they they got a bonus and, and, a, and a raise this time. Uh, who started that? The Ditch Witch. Ed Malls on himself. Then. Who did? The guy that owns it. It's. What's his last name? Ed Malls on. Mm -hmm. He's. Uh, in fact, his mother is responsible for this museum. Uh, she's the one that got this museum uh, through uh, Henry Bellman was governor and. Uh, they were good friends, and she's the one that really got the land donated, and and uh, Ed gave a hundred and thirty thousand towards it to, to start with, uh, and uh, he's still number one man out there. And in fact, my nephew who just left uh, back to South Carolina was a hit with head chemist on the atomic energy out there for Dupont, and uh, him and Ed room together going to college. Ed uh, has a. Uh, a degree in engineering and a degree in uh, in business administration. In fact, uh, how he had to come up with this first one, he saw this big ditcher going down the street, and then he's digging the ditch by hand into the house, and uh, that's where he came up with the idea. I was a, a scoutmaster years ago here, and uh, the first year he sold seventeen. Now uh, I just talked to Walter yesterday morning chap that he just got back from Australia, New Zealand, he's, uh, he merchandises it, does, that's what's made him, he's all over the world, he's got agents all over the world, yeah, and he also, the thing that makes him big is, in construction, your number one problem is, is parts, repair parts, and uh, that's what he features. After he started it, there was about a dozen started, and now he's, He's the uh, uh, caterpillar of. Uh, of Does he have the patent on it? Oh yes. Oh, he did. He he. When did he start the company? Oh hell, uh, twenty, thirty years ago, and uh, he manufactures uh, what they called uh, uh, earth saw. Now he's developed in. You'll see him on these highways around cutting through these pavements and all, and uh, the sky witch. Uh, his first thing he built was a Geronimo, and that up to land uh, on these oil rigs, there was no guy, uh, that guy up in, in the rig uh, had a fire, had no way of getting out. And they run this line out there in this uh, gadget letting they, they can stop it. He can run on out of there. That was his first, it was Geronimo. Yeah. Then uh, he, he, he's got the, the sky which that automatically goes up for it. Instead of building uh, things alongside of a building, it goes up uh, automatically. Yeah. And uh, uh, then he came out, one of his big uh, uh, sales is uh, these, uh, uh, electrical and telephone companies are burying those lines, you know, underground without digging a ditch. They put them in their laboratory. And, but, uh, and he's, oh, he's gave a lot to this town. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he gave, every year he gives the preachers, the churches so much, but not through his name. Uh, and. Uh, this building out at the fairgrounds, the stock building, they just completed it, a hundred and some thousand dollars. A fire station down there, a hundred and some thousand dollars. He, he really does, he's, uh, and uh, he, uh, he did this, no German boy. In fact, his grandparents and uh, father and them lived right across the street from us. Like, I wonder if his aunts are afraid they do. Wedding. How do you spell his last name? M -A it's M A L Z H A M. Better check it out there. I don't spell well. I never did. Well, I think we have a good interview. I've enjoyed talking to you. I've certainly enjoyed it. Thank you.